Hallelujah. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. Lord, we thank you for the spirit and the word, Lord God. We thank you for your Holy Spirit just moving this morning, touching people's lives. And Lord God, we thank you for your word, Lord God. We thank you for the foundation of your word that keeps us rock solid, Lord God, and our feet grounded in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I've I just been sensing just to um, come back to some foundations and talk about grace. Uh, it's just one of those subjects that you've just got to keep coming back around and coming back around and, and just get re-established in that truth. Because um, I've seen it all with grace. I've seen grace um, misunderstood. I've seen grace taken to the furthest extremes. And, um, you know, we've just got to come back to the Word of God and what it says. So I'm going to do three sessions on grace, righteousness, identity and, and grace. Amen. And just talk about the good rock solid foundations of grace because if anything that the devil tries to uh, take away is that and our, our standing in Jesus Christ. Amen. But you know, here's, here's the thing about foundations and one of the other things being a, a pastor for a while is sometimes I get shocked at where people's foundations are. Sometimes they're just so shaky and you know, the, and, and when, when the storms hit, you know, like Jesus said, when, when the storms hit, when the foundations are not there, you can actually really tell because people just start to fall apart. And uh, I know when, uh, I mean, I'm not a builder by any means, but when I, um, I went and we built our house and I went and become a, uh, uh, on paper, an owner builder, but, just, but not a builder by anything, and then got someone to come and help me, I was shocked at how much money, basically half the cost of the house was in the foundations. And I'm like, and the devil's going, you're gonna run out of money, you're gonna run out of money. <laughs> But just to, and the great thing is, is that when, when we did the foundations, we buried a Bible in our foundations and we put, wrote scripture. It was quite funny because one of the builders was there and, and, and I was just dressed normal and he's like, um, who's this for? Is it a pastor or something? I said, yeah, that'd be me. He goes, oh, you could have had a collar on or something, so we knew you were. <laughs> so uh, that was a good witness because I said, don't seal it up until we've got a Bible. And we put a youth Bible in there, by the way, so there's a Bible in our foundations. But it's, it is the most, it's the most important part of the house, but it's the part you don't see. You know, you rarely see actually the foundations. But, um, you know, I, I realised, like, especially building up, that if those foundations weren't right, and especially building it up on piers, you know, with all the all the floods and the rains that we had, we, it probably would have been like the ark and be floating down the river. <laughs> And I tell you what, um, because the guy who helped me, he was, he was actually an ex-missionary, but very old school. We actually built it with hammer and nail, not even with the um, stable gun. And, um, but I tell you what, when, when we've had strong winds, especially being up high, and when we've had all that rain, that thing just has not moved. And it's, just, and it's all because of how good the foundations are. So um, very, very important part, and it's good to keep coming back to those foundations and make sure that they're solid, especially in the days that we live in. Amen? Amen. Um, because, yeah, you, the storms are, are here and the storms are coming, but, it, you know, and sometimes you'll be questioning yourself and the enemy will question you, and it's your foundations that are going to keep you strong. So one of the main um, functions of an apostle is to lay good, strong foundations. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 3.11, he says, for no other foundation can be laid than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. In fact, that's one of the scriptures we actually put on our on the concrete, our foundations. That, and then he talks about, you know, others build, but that's the foundation is Jesus Christ. So we're going to talk about, so one of those foundations, we're going to talk about righteousness. So um, let's start in Romans 5.17. It says, for if by the one man's offence... Death reigned through the one. How much more those who receive abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one Jesus Christ? Let me say that again. How much more those who receive abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one Jesus Christ? So righteousness is a gift. Very, very important. Because a lot of people think that um, righteousness still has to be earned and still has to be walked out. It's actually a gift. And, and I, you know, I often do an example. If I, if I gave this Bible to um, Maurice and I said, this is a gift. Thanks. And then if I said, went up to her later and said, you know, that, 
that cost me $100, so if you give me $10 a week for the next 10 weeks, we'll be square, right? She'd be confused, wouldn't she? Because she said, I thought it was a gift. That's what we do. We, righteousness is a gift, but we still think we have to earn it. We still have to, and, and it takes away from the fact that it's a gift. <laughs> that when we try to earn our righteousness, we're actually taking away from the fact that it's the same with salvation. Salvation is a gift, amen? Something we don't have to earn. It's freely given by Jesus Christ. And the same way he's given us salvation, he's actually given us righteousness. So you don't have to earn your right stand with God. It was a gift that was given by Jesus Christ. Amen. And that is a foundation you've got to keep coming back to. Because when, when, when you do stuff up as we do, <laughs> and Paul talks about that clearly in, in Romans 7. He says, the things I should be doing, I'm not doing. And, you know, who's going to save me from this? We have to keep coming back to we are in right standing with God every day of our life. Because the gift that was given to us by Jesus Christ. Amen. It's not something I have to... If I start a bad day and I kick the cat and swear at somebody and carry on. And then think, oh my goodness, I've now got to start to you know, correct myself and earn, earn my now right standing with God. Because I've got out of... Well, that's all wrong. Because I am in right standing with God. No, no matter what my behaviour is, the fact is I'm in right standing with God. Because it's a gift that's been given to me. Amen. And when we understand that, it actually changes our behaviour, believe it or not. So, Okay, one of, one of the, the best scriptures you'll hear, and you'll know very well, Romans 1, 16 to 17. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is as written, the just shall live by faith. Now, I want to give you that same scripture in the Good News Translation because it's the best way to describe what that means. So here's the same scripture in the Good News Translation. I have complete confidence in the gospel. <laughs> What's the gospel? Good news. I have complete confidence in this good news. It is the power to save all who believe, first the Jews and also the Gentiles. So here's the good news. The gospel reveals how God puts people right with himself. Isn't that awesome? It's not how people put themselves right with God. It's how God puts himself right with us. It is through faith from beginning to end. As the scripture says, the person who is put right with God through faith shall live. Isn't that powerful? So the very thing we couldn't do, the thing the law couldn't do, us trying to get ourselves right with God... God said, okay, guess what? I'm going to do something completely different. I'm going to put myself right with you through the good news of Jesus Christ coming, dying on the cross, taking away your sin and giving you as a gift his righteousness. That's what put us right with God. What he did for us, not what we tried to do for him. And you know, the sad thing is, is that people believe that and then go on to try to get themselves right with God all the time. But that's not the gospel. <laughs> The good news is everything that we ever tried to do and religion tries to do to put yourself right with God, God smashed it and he said, guess what? I'm going to do it. I'm going to put myself right with you. And then forever you're in a right standing with me. Isn't that amazing? That is, that is the good news. <laughs> that is the good news. So the gospel, the good news, it is the power of God to save us. It's so powerful it can save everyone. It's something I'm not ashamed of. In fact, it's something I have complete confidence in. So that's the important part. I have complete confidence in this good news that God put himself right with me and I need to live and walk by that in faith. That's what that scripture is saying. Because if I'm not believing that by faith, I'm tossed around. I'm not confident. I'm not sure my, my standing with God. I'm not sure where I stand. You know, if I'm, if I'm doing well, I'm, I know I'm in, in um, yeah, right standing with God. But if I'm not doing well, I'm not in right standing with God. And so we, we're a mess. We're all over the place. We don't know where we stand. But this tells me where I stand because God put himself right with me. So I don't have, you know, that's every day that I wake up, I know I'm in right standing with God because what he did for me as opposed to what I did for him. And so I can have confidence in that because I'm confident in my God and what he said. Amen. So we can be confident. So, that, so that's verse 16. Verse 17, 
says the gospel is righteousness revealed. The gospel reveals how God put himself right, um, put himself right with us. So here's the age-old question, and it was one that um, Martin Luther would ask, how can a man be righteous before a holy God? That's how the Catholic Church would actually manipulate people because they say, okay, if you want to be right standing with God, you've got to pay penance and you've got to crawl up the, the steps of the Sistine Chapel and all these things, they put religion around it <coughs> to make, make you keep doing things to get yourself in right standing with God. And, um, and that became powerful for them. But here's the thing. Um, how, how can we... Be, you know, how can a man who's um, unholy and unrighteous you know, stand before a righteous God? Because he put himself right with us. That's how we can do it. And um, here's the thing. Every blessing we have comes from being in right standing with God. It's the foundation of our relationship with him. So we can come boldly to the throne room of God. We can come to our Father, no matter what, what we, how, how we live and what we're doing, we can come to him because we're in right standing with him. And every blessing that comes from God is because we're in right standing with him. Amen? Every day of your life. Now, I've heard people say like, oh, well, you know, um, God's, God's withholding his blessing. No, he's not. <laughs> what we're doing, the blessing of God is like having a hose which has got full pressure and then our, our, by our lives, we can squeeze that hose so there's only a drip coming out. But it's not stop, stopping the blessing of God, amen? We can counteract that by what we do. But God's not withholding his blessing because we are in right standing with him, amen? Yes. It's our lives and what we do that can actually constrict that. Does that make sense? Amen. <laughs> so I, I love to, you know, it talks about the gospel. I love to use that. When I'm just talking to somebody about the gospel, I just say things like, you know, um, do you believe in heaven? And it's people like, oh, well, I'd like to. Well, do you, would you like to get there? Yes, I would. So, how, but how? You know, how do you, and then I just say, do you think heaven's a perfect place? Well, yeah. I say, well, how can an imperfect person go to a perfect place? You actually leave them with the, you know, the, the conundrum, the, the puzzle. And then you actually share the good news. <laughs> That Jesus actually came to die, and in his perfection, he took our imperfection so that we can actually now go to a perfect place. It's that simple. <laughs> um, 2 Corinthians 5.21 is the great exchange. He, for he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Amen? So that was the exchange that took place. He actually took our sin but gave us our righteousness. That's the, the problem. A lot of people are living with half the salvation. <laughs> they, they know their sin's forgiven, but they don't understand the righteous, the gift of righteousness. You know? They understand the gift of salvation and their, their sin. The problem is if you don't understand righteousness, your sin can be taken away. But what happens tomorrow? <laughs> what happens when you sin tomorrow? Does Jesus have to come back and try and take away your sin again? You know, you're living in this half... Uh, yeah, it's like the people in the promised the promise land. They, they, they knew God, they got there, but they didn't enter in because they didn't understand, understand their standing. And so, you know, Satan tries to get... Here's, here's the trick of the devil. Satan tries to get you to earn something that you already have. Do you know he started that right from the garden? Adam and Eve. He said, oh, you know... Um, God doesn't want you to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil because you'll be like him. Guess what? They were like him. <laughs> they were made in God's image. They were, they were you know, greater than the angels, but they, were, you know, they weren't God, but they were you know, as close to... You know, they were made in his image, and they, you know, man was given the, crea the ability to create. You know, Satan hates the fact that women can have babies. Why do you think there's so much abortion? Because Satan can't create. But God has given creative power to humans, you know. And so, so he was actually trying them to, to get, earn something that they already had. And, you know, you watch that. Satan will do that to you all the time. He'll try to, you know, oh, I need to be in right standing with God. No, you're in right standing with God. <laughs> um, and so that's one of the tricks, and he still does it today. So, so we are already in right standing with God. He took away our sin, gave us his righteousness. Amen. Can I have an amen? Yes. Okay. I'm just going to throw heaps of scripture at you. Amen. 
Romans 3, 21 to 26. But now the righteousness of God, apart from the law, is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Okay, so all of this was talked about way back in the Old Testament. Even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ. That's our righteousness. We've been given it. How we walk in it is through faith. Amen? When you, when you feel that you're unrighteous, you need to make a righteous declaration by faith. I am the righteousness of God in Christ. It is a gift that's been given. God is not a God's not an Indian giver. I can tell you that. All right? <laughs> he doesn't do what I tried to do, Maurice, and just say, well, here's a gift, but you can pay for it. Okay? He doesn't do that. If he knows what a gift is, it's a gift. He doesn't try to get it back. It's a gift. Amen? Can we all say righteousness is a gift? Yes. Amen. All right. God's not an Indian giver. Yes. <laughs> Apologise to Indians that are watching this today. All right. So, even the righteousness of God through faith in Christ to all and on all who believe. Do you believe? Yes. Okay. For there is no difference. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. I love, I love to talk because I'm pretty tall. So, And other people I say, well, some have fallen more short than others. <laughs> but here's the thing. We're all in the same boat. That's why we can actually preach the gospel. I'm no better than anybody else on the street. I don't deserve the righteousness of God. I don't deserve his salvation. I don't deserve to go to heaven. I don't deserve it. But I've been given a gift. And I'm hanging on to that gift. That's what's my ticket to heaven. That's what's my right standing with God. That's why I'm in relationship with God. That's why I can expect him to heal me. That's why I can expect favour in my life. Because of the gift that he gave me. And no other reason. Amen. We've all fall short of the glory of God. The person out there is no better than I am. The only difference is, is that I got a gift. And I'm, I'm walking it out by faith. And that gift is available to everybody. Amen. I used to, when I was um, uh, working in the freight industry, I think I've told you this before, but you know, I, I just rely on the Holy Spirit and the favour of God to get my business because it was one of those businesses where there was more freight companies than there was freight. <laughs> and so a lot of reps only lasted one or two years because they got burned out. It was a hard industry to be in. I lasted in it for 11 years. And so I just listened to the Holy Spirit. I'd be obedient. If you said, go to that customer now, I'd go straight away. I was talking to one of the reps and he goes, um, mate, that's an unfair advantage. I said, well, you can have the same. <laughs> you can have the same advantage. It's not just exclusive to me. <laughs> anyway. So, all of sin and fall short of the glory of God. Being justified freely by his grace. You know what the word justified means? Justified, never sinned. Okay? It's all in the past. By the way, I want to tell you this and this will help you. Do you know when you get saved, you have a new history? You have a new history. You're born again. When does your history start? When you're born. <laughs> My history does not go beyond when I was born. Okay, I was born on the 6th of February 1963. I don't have a history prior to that. I was born again when I was five years old. I have a new history and it started from there. When you got saved, you have a new history and it's all in Jesus Christ. Amen. So when the devil wants to come and talk about your history, it's talking to the wrong person. That's when my history started. That's when your history started. Amen. Amen. And so don't let him go into your history. It's history. <laughs> All right. Don't get me started. All right. So, so being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, God, um, whom God set forth a propitiation by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness because of his forbearance, God had passed over the sins that were previously committed to demonstrate at this present time his righteousness, that he might be the just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Don't let people say that your sins have been atoned for. It's rubbish. Your sins have been taken away. Amen? That's happened in the Old Testament. That's Old Testament. You know, they had to atone for sins. But when Jesus came... By one sacrifice, he made, um, made perfect those who are being sanctified forever. Amen? He actually did what all, all the um, previous sacrificial system could not do. You know, it says in Hebrews is that you know, daily they would do sacrifices but could never make anybody perfect. Amen? But Jesus made you perfect. Jesus made you righteous by one sacrifice. And so your, your sin is not atoned for. Your sin is taken away. It's gone. It doesn't exist. 
So let me just go through that scripture. So verse 21, it talks about righteousness revealed. Verse 22, through faith in Jesus and everyone who believes, there's no difference with all sin. But in verse 24, where it says we've been freely justified by his grace. So grace is um, undeserved, um, unde un um, earned undeserved merit. So we have received justification through his grace. And then that word in 25, propitiation, means appeasement or Passover. So whom God set forth as an appeasement is probably a, a word we understand, by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness. And then verse 26 talks about justification, justification by faith. It is through faith from beginning to end. So when we get back to um, Romans, it says, The person who is put right through God through faith shall live, or the just shall live by faith. So Paul brings this amazing example. He talks about Abraham. And he loved to talk about Abraham with the, the Pharisees because the Pharisees would often say, oh, look at Abraham and look at how righteous he was and uh, look at how right standing. So they, they would actually try to portray Abraham as such a good guy who was deserving of um, yeah, the blessing of God, right? And Paul just laughed. <laughs> He's like, hang on a sec, are you talking about the guy who lied about his wife and, you know, who uh, you know, did all these different things? So let's have a look at it. So they called Abraham is called the father of all who believe. Um, let's, let's, sorry, Romans 4.16. Therefore it is of faith that it might be according to grace, so that the promise might be sure to all the seed, not only to those who are of the law, but also of those who are of faith of Abraham, who is the father of all. So Abraham is called the father of all who believe. He believed the promise and it was accounted to him as righteousness. So those who believe in the promise of, of Jesus, by the way, it was Jesus who actually took him by the hand and walked him out and said, look at the stars. You have a look at him, the word of God. Because he, you know, we can say, well, the Lord spoke to him. You, you read it. The Lord turned up and actually took him out and, and showed him the stars, right? And we know that's Jesus because God isn't there. The no one's seen God face to face. That's according to Scripture. Um, the uh, uh, the Holy Spirit never comes in in uh, humankind. It was Jesus. I'm convinced of it. And so, so he met Jesus. <laughs> you know, even Jesus said, you know, um, be before Abraham was, I am. And so they were they were saying, how can how can you say you met Abraham? You're not even 50 years old. And so he said, Abraham saw my day, and he and he rejoiced. They met each other. <laughs> it's clear to me anyway. <laughs> okay. So so he he met Jesus. He believed in the, in Jesus who would die on the cross. It was accounted to him as righteousness. So those in the Old Testament who look forward to the cross, it was accounted as righteousness. We look back to the cross and it's accounted as righteousness. So and then through him all the nations shall be blessed. Now he here's an interesting thing, I don't know if you ever picked this up. In Galatians three eight it says God actually preached the gospel to Abraham. Do you know that? He preached the gospel to Abraham. So let's read it. Galatians 3.8. And scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel to Abraham beforehand, saying, In you all the nations shall be blessed. Do you think that's the good news? Absolutely. We, that one of the good news, one of the great things about it being Australian is that we've supported Israel. And we've seen blessing, blessing in that. That's the good news right there. He believed God would give him a son, and we believe God has given us a son. Amen? So he believed to the future. So, so Jesus actually preached the, preached the gospel. God preached the gospel to him about the son that was coming. We preached the gospel about the son who has come and is coming again. Amen? Is that cool? All right. So you wonder why, why Abraham believed? Well... I think if Jesus preached the gospel to me, I believe. <laughs> well, you, you, are, you are Jesus preaching the gospel to your friends. So. Okay, Romans, um, let's talk about imputed righteousness. So Romans 4, 5 to 8. But to him who does not... Um, by the way, I've got an extra hour because that clock... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's only, I can't even read it, but it's definitely showing an hour. Isn't it? <laughs> So uh, I'm glad we've got extra time today. <laughs> no All right. Romans 4, 5 to 8. But to him who does 
um, not work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly. Let me underline that, who justifies the ungodly. doesn't say who justifies the godly. His faith is accounted for righteousness. So when you're, <laughs> when you're being ungodly, guess what? Your, your faith is accounted for righteousness. Now, I'm not going to ask you to put your hands up, but, you know, we don't always live godly lives, do we? We'd love to. Paul, I love, I love Paul. Paul's so real in, in Romans 7. Paul, person we all look up to, wrote two-thirds of the gospel. says, I don't always do what I'm meant to do. <laughs> and I find myself at war with this. It's because we, we've been left in this body of flesh. But God justifies the ungodly, you know. We, we might serve God, but sometimes we, what we do is ungodly. But it doesn't change our righteous standing. Amen. And I, I'll, you all I'll think I'm promoting being ungodly. I'm not, but we'll get, we'll get to that. We'll get to that. Because that's the problem that people shy away from grace. Because they think, mind you, they, they think, oh, grace is just a license to sin. I've never seen anybody who needs a license to sin. <laughs> They sin without a license. <laughs> Some people are driving on the road without a license, which is silly. Actually, I think um, Joseph Prince put it the best way. He actually said this. He said, I travel around the world, and he said, oh, my wife probably loves me more than I love her. And he said, and I travel around the world, and I could get into trouble. I could do things immoral. She probably wouldn't even know. He said, but her love for me compels me to do the right thing by her. Isn't that amazing? So guess what grace does? His love for us compels us to actually live godly lives. That's what, that's, when you really understand grace, you'll understand that you, you don't, you don't want to do ungodly acts. You don't want to do things that actually, be to, that would mess up your relationship. Yeah, it doesn't mess up your relationship as far as your standing, but you just don't want to do that stuff because the, the length that Jesus went and his love to actually bring salvation, everything that we don't deserve, you just fall in love with him. And, and it just becomes part of your worship towards him that I want to live my life in... in um, that's Actually, there's a scripture that says, I want to live my life worthy of the fact that I'm actually going to escape out of what's to come. There's a scripture that talks about that. And so that law can't do that. When law says, oh, well, you know, if you, you better live this way or live that way or you'll be punished... All you do is try to find a way around it or, you know, or, or, do, or, or live in fear of getting punished. But grace is that you live your life in a godly manner because of love. Because, because he first loved us. I don't deserve, I don't, you know, sin deserves death. That's what I deserve. But he actually, we used to sing a song that says, um, uh, I owed a debt I could not pay. Um, he, he paid a debt I could not owe. I owed a debt I could not pay. I needed someone to wash my sins away. And now I sing a brand new song, Amazing Grace, the whole day long. Christ Jesus paid the debt that I couldn't pay. So when you understand that the, the, the lengths that Jesus went to and dying on a cross, that barbaric cross, so that he could pour his love out on me, so that I could enjoy being with him and that, it's our response. We just respond to him. We respond to grace and love. Titus talks about it's actually grace that causes us to live um, godly in an ungodly world. Because it's actually, and that's something law can't do. Law, you don't respond to law in love. You respond to law in fear. And um, that's never, that was never God's intention. It's actually for us to respond in love. Anyway, okay. <laughs> Romans 4, 5 to 8. But to him who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the godly, his faith is accounted for righteousness. Just as David also describes the blessed, blessedness of the man to whom God imputes righteousness apart from works. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom shall not impute sin. So that's a quote from the Old Testament. So, imputed righteousness. Well, here's the thing. David was a murderer and adulterer, and under the law should have been stoned. And the Bible says God justifies the ungodly. So, do you remember that um, uh, David said to Nathan, I'd rather be, come, go at the mercy of God than at the mercy of men? Because he actually knew that God is far more merciful than man can be. And um, 
So instead, like Abraham, he believed in Jesus whom, on whom he um, justifies and it was accounted for righteousness. David says, I'm blessed and so is every man and woman who believes in Jesus because your sin is not counted against you and your righteousness is imputed to you. That's what he's actually saying in that scripture. So the best way I can probably explain imputed righteousness is that, say, um, you've got a bank account and it's, you're in debt for a, a million dollars and you're just like, oh, I don't, I'm never going to pay that back. I don't know how that's ever going to happen. And so you go to the ATM and not only has the debt gone, but you've got um, $100 million sitting in your bank account. So not only do you have to now worry about how am I going to pay it, but everything you ever need is in this world. You've got enough money to last you for the rest of your life. That's what imputed righteousness is. He took the debt but he actually gave you his righteousness to carry you right through until you actually go to be with the Lord. Amen? That's imputed righteousness. That's right standing. Um, I remember Pastor Ken used to say this line, it's not, it's not our condition that determines our position, it's our position that determines our condition. In other words, it's not, it's not what you do that determines who you are, it's who you are that determines what you do. And knowing who we are, knowing that we are the righteousness of God in Christ, knowing the grace of Jesus will outwork its way in what we do. Amen? Not the other way around. The devil will try to point to your condition and then in turn then say your position. You know, you're, uh, you're this, you're that, you've done that. And so, you know, you're not in right standing with God. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says I am in right standing with God. And because of that, that will actually change the way I live. So I think Joseph Prince says, um, it's right believing that lives to right living. Yeah. Amen? Okay. So in Matthew, here's the interesting thing. In Matthew 3.15, when Jesus was um, when facing John the Baptist, and John the Baptist was really confused. I think someone mentioned this the other day. Because Jesus asked to be baptised. It's like, it's a, it's a baptism of sin. Why would I baptise a sinless person? I'm confused, right? And this is what Jesus said. He said to him, Permit it to be so now, for thus it is fulfilling, thus it is fitting to fulfill all righteousness. Then he allowed him. So that's the interesting thing. He didn't say, Oh, it's just to fulfill scripture. He said it's to fulfill all righteousness. In other words, what he was going to do is that it was a symbol that he, he was, the sinner's baptism was that he was going to take on the sins of the world. For, to fulfill all righteousness that we might be the righteousness of God in Christ. Amen. That's why he did it. It was symbolic. Because he said, I'm, you know, you might think I, I shouldn't be baptised right now because, because I'm sinless. But basically he's saying, no, I'm actually going to carry the sins of the world and make the world sinless. <laughs> make the world become righteous. Amen. So Jesus presented himself to John as a sin's baptism to fulfill all righteousness. The Jordan was a picture of what would happen at the cross. When he went into the water, was burial. When he came out, was the resurrection. The heaven opened. He said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Jesus is saying that to you today and every single day. This is my beloved son. This is my beloved daughter in whom I am well pleased. Why? Because of the righteousness of Christ. Because you are in right standing. So not, no matter what you're doing or what your condition, your position is, is that you're in right standing with God and that's the basis of our relationship and that's why he says you, he pleased with you. The conflicting thing is that we do things and then the devil says, no, God's not pleased with you now because of what you've done. You need to stand on the word of God and say, you're wrong. He is pleased with me because of what Jesus Christ has done and I am the righteousness of God in Christ. That is my right standing with God. Amen. And you know what? That stops us from being all over the place. Every wind of doctrine and being unsettled is a rock-solid foundation that you live from every single day of your life. Yeah. Amen. How are we going? <laughs> right. Okay. It's good to be reminded of this stuff, hey? Amen. It's really good. Okay. Because, um, you know... Even when it comes to witnessing to people, I, we, we had a lady friend who was, uh, she was a friend of uh, one of my sons. And uh, she actually came, it's interesting how people come to church after major crisis. So she came to church after the Bali bombing. And um, there was an appeal she didn't come out. And when I talked to her later, she said, I, I, I didn't think that I could come out the front and accept Jesus because 
of, you know, I didn't deserve it or, you know, because of my sin or whatever. So people think, well, I, I don't deserve that. I can't go and do that because I'm not in right standing. They get it, they, they put the, the, the cart before the horse. It's like, I have to be in right standing before I could ever ask Jesus to come and save me or heal me or do. You know what I love doing? I love praying for people that don't deserve it and they know they don't deserve it. Um, the publican um, next door, the owner, you know, I, I seriously challenged, challenged me one day because he was having some problems. So I said, let me pray for you. He goes, oh, God's not interested in me. Look, I run poke machines and everything. I said, <laughs> I said no, you don't understand. God loves you and he wants to favour you. And he, he wants to, um, he actually, he even wants your, your business to, to succeed because, you know, the thing is, if he gets, if he gets the favour of God and gets the message, he'll probably might even turn that into a prayer, a church or something, who knows? But it's, it's the goodness of God that leads people to repentance. And the whole world thinks it's the other way around. Because of whether they've grown up in the Catholic system or whatever, they think they've got to pull, you know, they've got to get themselves to a place where then they can ask for God or ask for God. And it's like, no, Jesus came freely to give. Look at what happened when he was around. He healed people. He didn't say, oh, where are you up to today? Have you sinned this morning? Well, no, we'll, we'll leave you to one side. Oh, you've been a good person. Well, you know, it doesn't work that way. But the world thinks it works that way. We even start to think it works that way because we get lied to. It doesn't work that way. Everything we have and every blessing we get is because God poured out, yeah, poured out his love and righteousness towards us. And, you know, and he causes the rain to come on the, the godly and the ungodly. So... You know, blow people away. See God heal them and, and favour them and everything. Because who knows before you got saved that you, after you got saved, you look back and you say, oh, actually God was there and God was here and God was doing this in my life and God saved me from that. He was actually there all along. He just brought me to that place of salvation. And, and it's the goodness of God that leads people to salvation. So let's start to displaying the goodness of God on people who think they don't deserve it. Because I don't deserve it either. <laughs> I don't. Not, not in my flesh. The only reason I, I get it is because of the gift of righteousness. That's the only reason in what Jesus did. Okay. Um, yes, yeah, so John 12, 3, 31 to 32. Now the judgment of this world, now the rule of this world would be cast out. And if I'm lifted up, I will draw, it says, all peoples to myself. That was, that's, in, it, that's actually a, um, in italics, it's been inserted. It should be, if I be lifted up, I will draw all to myself. You look at the verse before and it's talking about judgment. What Jesus actually was saying is that if I be lifted up, I will draw all judgment to myself. That's what that scripture should really say. So God imputed our sin to Jesus and imputed his righteousness to us. When he was lifted up, all judgment went to him. Let me say this. I'm going to break in the middle here. You really know somebody who understands that they're not being judged by God because they become very, very less judgmental. People that are not judgmental are that way because they understand that they don't, they don't, deserve, they deserve to be judged by God. But because of their righteousness and what everything that Jesus Christ has done, then we're not living under that judgment. And so when you really get a hold of that, guess what? how the outworking is? You become less judgmental. Guess what happens with grace? The people that I know, I, I know when somebody understands grace because they become very gracious. They're gracious people. I've seen people use grace like law and, and like, oh, you know, you should be doing this or that. And like, oh, you shouldn't be in this and you should be understanding that. Or you, you, know, you don't, don't understand grace properly. That can be law. And so... Um, Here's the thing, is that when I understand that when Jesus went on the cross, he drew all judgment to himself, all judgment that belonged to me, to himself, how can I be judgmental? How can I judge someone else when he actually has, hasn't judged me and taken that judgment in his body and given me his righteousness as a gift? <laughs> Amen? Yes. It, it, actually, it actually helps you to, to live, live a life that's um, more like God. Okay, Romans 10.3. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own righteousness have not submitted to the righteousness of God. So the Jews were ignorant to God's righteousness and many churches are the same. They're ignorant to the righteousness of God and um, going about trying to establish their own righteousness through behaviour performance. 
I remember a lady at one church I was at and she said, oh, we should be teaching people to be, you know, more righteous. I said, yeah, good luck with that. <laughs> I said, we've all tried that before. Oh, you need to do this or do that, stop doing that. And, and I said, it doesn't work that way. It's an, uh, right believing, right um, believing leads to right living. You know, when you understand that you are righteous, again, that's the whole thing of trying to, the devil trying to get, get you to get something you already have. What? You know, you don't have to teach people to be righteous. You have to teach people that they are righteous. Amen. Um, there was a, a, an interesting experiment they did in um, uh, Harvard College did at a school. And what they did is they went to this school and they said, right, they said to the, they got the teachers together and they said, look, we want to form a smart class. We want to get all, get, give us all the students from your classes and would form a class of just the real smart ones and see, see how they achieve. So they said, yeah, that's a good experiment. Let's do that. And, and they said, well, get, get the smartest teachers that you've got and we'll get this class and we'll see how they perform. And so they did it as an experiment at the school. And what happened is that they excelled. They, they just, they, by having all the smart kids in one class and the smartest teachers, the whole class excelled. And so then they got back with them and they said, well, how did the experiment go? They said, it was amazing. This, these, these kids were amazing at how, how good it was. And they said, well, we've got something to tell you. We didn't actually pick the smartest kids. We drew them out of the hat. And they said, oh, well, you picked the smartest teachers. They said, no, we drew you out of the hat as well. <laughs> the thing was, because the teachers believed they were the smartest and the kids believed they were the smartest, they actually lived up to what they were told, what they believed. And that's how, what happens with righteousness. You don't have to teach someone to be righteous. You need to tell them they are righteous. And all they have to do is start living who they are. That's all we have to do. And, and you know, you wonder why you have conflict when you sin, because that's not who you are. <laughs> that's not who you are. And so that's what, you know, that's, you know, um, there's a difference between, and I can, I'll show you another time in scripture, but, the, the Holy Spirit does not, um, does not convict the, um, Christ, the believer of sin. He actually, he actually convicts him of righteousness. The Bible says in, I think it's John 6, he says, um, the Holy Spirit has come to convict um, the enemy of judgment, um, unbelievers of sin, and, the right, and, and believers of righteousness. So the difference is, um, I'll pick on Michael. So say, say Michael is... Um, you know, done something wrong and then um, what happens is that the enemy will come along, say it's on a Saturday and go, you can't go to church Michael, look at the behaviour that's, that's not what a Christian does you know, how, can, how can you go to church right? so I, I know straight away who's saying that, it's not God right? this is what the Holy Spirit will do, Michael you might have messed up on Saturday but that's not who you are and the enemy's trying to tell you not to go, go to church but that's what Christians do and so just, you know, put that aside. You know, the Bible says, The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. He delights in his way, though he falls. It doesn't say if he falls. He knows he'll fall. He says, Though he falls, he's not cast down. The Lord upholds him in his hand. That's what the Holy Spirit does. He takes you by the hand. He goes, Michael, that's not who you are. You are righteous. You are, you know, you, you are saved. That's, that your behavior is not consistent with who you are. Just, just leave that behind and start and start um, having the behaviour consistent with who you are. That's why we have so much conflict. That's when, when we do sin, we have conflict. And the conflict is because it's not who we are. It's not according to who we are. So all we've got to do is just leave that behind, say, Lord, I'm sorry. And, um, you know, the Bible says, that word, that thing that says, um, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness, all right? You'd sort of ask the question, well, hang on a sec. Um, it didn't, has all our sins been taken away? What does that mean? What that means, the, the word confess in the, um, in the Greek means to, to say the same as. That's what it actually means. So, so you know, when, we, when, when um, we, we do the wrong thing, let's just call it what it is. It's okay. You know, it's funny because, you know, um, once, once upon adultery was adultery, then it became, you know, oh, well, just living in sin, then it became, well, you know, exploring my sexuality, you know, like it would just get watered and watered down. Now call it what it is. That's what this is. If we call it what it is, he's faithful and just to forgive us because he's already, and to cleanse us. You're not going to get the cleansing if you, if you go, oh, no, it was, 
that was somebody else's fault, you know. Oh yeah, I did a bit of road rage, but if that guy hadn't caught me off, you know, it wouldn't, that wouldn't have happened. No, just take responsibility. Just call it what it is. Say, sorry, Lord, I mucked up. He said, yeah, I know that's not who you are. Let's just get on with being who you are. And that's as simple as it is. <laughs> is that cool? Yes. All right. Otherwise, we can go get into the, like, oh, well, you know, I haven't confessed it, so I'm, I'm not forgiven. <laughs> do you know there's sins of omission and commission? There are sins that we do know, and there's sins we don't know. I could have... I could have sinned on the way here and <laughs> upset a few people without even knowing it. The wonderful thing is that the blood of Jesus covers all of that, <laughs> you know. So I don't have to go. The things that God reveals, just say yes. And the things we know, just be honest and say, hey, I mucked up. God says, yeah, I know. You'll probably do it again. <laughs> you know? But um, Lord, and, and just keep the, the slate clean. Amen. You know, um, I'm, I'm going, I'm going, way up. you'll have this, um, <laughs> Andrew, I'm going off my notes. Um, you know, when Peter, when um, Jesus was washing Peter's feet and Peter said, no, 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 Lord, you know, you're not going to do that. And he goes, well, unless I do that, um, you know, you're not a part of me. So he said, I'll wash all of me then. He said, no, I don't need to do that. <laughs> See, you've been washed, but sometimes your feet get dirty. We go out, and the, what happened? They were wearing sandals, the dust gets on your feet, your dust get dirty. We go out in this world, our feet get dirty, and Jesus just cleanses our feet. You know, and we just bring that dirt to him, he just cleanses it. We don't need to be totally washed, because we're already washed, amen? amen? We already know who we are. But, you know, even though we're righteous, sometimes we do unrighteous acts, <coughs> and, and we just bring it to God, and he, he cleanses it. And even if we, if the things we don't know are covered, or covered as well, or you know, are taken by Jesus Christ, that's, that's the wonderful thing. So you can stay in that assurance that you're righteous. Amen. I can't go, guys. How are we going for time? Got another hour. I've got a few more scriptures. Are, are you cool? Shall we keep going? Yes. Keep going. Right. Okay. All right. So. Um, okay. This is a doozy. Hebrew five thirteen. Everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he's a babe. We always think that says the word of God. No, it doesn't. It says the word of righteousness. Then it goes, but solid food belongs to those who are full of age, that is, those who are um, by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. If you are unskilled in the word of righteousness, you still obey. That's what it's actually saying. It's funny how we change words, so we think it says something else. No, it doesn't. So, unfortunately, you can have people that are leading churches who do not understand righteousness, and so they're a baby running a church. <laughs> we need to be skilled in the word of righteousness. That means that not only um, do are we walking in it, but we can actually explain it, that we can talk about it, that we can teach it, because, you know, babies only, uh, only receive it, okay? Receiving righteousness is one thing. Being able to actually talk about it and understand it and be a part of your life is the next level, amen. And so, um, so we don't we don't behave unto righteousness. We believe unto righteousness. The foundation of all blessing is. Um, oh, sorry, I've, I've gone forward on my notes. Yeah, many pastors claiming to be fathers are still babes. In epistle, in Paul's epistles, he wrote once, uh, not once, did he call Christians sinners, but he called us saints, holy ones and righteous. By whose obedience were you made righteous? By his obedience. So. You see right through the epistles, he actually, he actually says to the saints, to the, you, you read it, right? To the saints in Corinth, to the saints, right? Do you think the Corinthians were acting saintly? Do you think they were acting righteously? No. So why did he say that? Because he told them who they are. That's why. Because he thought, okay, before I start to correct you and before I start to tell you how you should live, I'm going to tell you who you are. You are... He says the, the saints, which actually means holy ones, right? We, we again, watered that down. We'd say, to the Christians at Tobolgum, right? But that's not what Paul did. He said, to the saints. He called them saints. He knew that their, the way they behaved was not saintly. <laughs> to the saints. To the to St. George. To the saints. So here's the thing, is that that's, how, that's what we've got to establish before you, before you actually talk about how you should live, it's actually who you are. That's how, actually, if you read the book of Ephesians, the first three chapters talks about who you are, 
And then the last three chapters talk about how you should walk based on who you are. Amen? If you, re if you only um, teach the last three chapters, you know, talking about, you know, wives love your husbands and how children should act, how husbands should act, how masters should act, and you don't teach people who they are, you've actually put the cart before the horse again. And all you're trying to do is actually do it in your flesh. And so Paul was very good at that. Because his letters in, in Corinthians was addressing them, you know, and how they shouldn't take each other to the court and a lot of behaviour. But you know what he started with? Identity, who they are, to the saints in Corinth. So he was actually giving, telling them their um, position before he started talking about their condition. Okay, Romans 5.19. For as by one man's obedience many were made sinners, also by one man's, um, dis sorry, one man's disobedience, Many were made sinners, also by one man's obedience, many were made righteous. So Adam's sin was imputed to us. I think there's going to be a lot of people lined up wanting to have a chat to Adam when we get to him. <laughs> but Jesus, so one man, you know, uh, you know, don't don't ever let people tell you that like, oh, children come into this world perfect. You know, no, they don't. They come in with a sin nature. The first, first word they learn is no. <laughs> I was at a shop one time and I was looking at something and, and this little came up and said, mine. I said, what's your name? He said, no, sorry, your name's not written on there. That's not yours. <laughs> so we come into this world with a sin nature. One person plunged us into that. So one person got, it, got us out of it. Amen. One person, our sin was imputed through Adam, but through Jesus Christ, Righteous was, righteousness has been imputed to us. We don't behave unto righteousness, we believe unto righteousness. The foundation of all blessing is our, is our right relationship with God. So, um, for 2 Corinthians 5.19, that is that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. How do we reconcile the world to, to us, and that is what we do, is we actually let them know that Jesus is not imputing their sin to them. See, the sin, the sin problem's been dealt with. It was dealt with at the cross. Amen? Flesh is the problem. <laughs> living, in, wanting to, yeah, living in the flesh and dealing with the flesh, that's the problem that, that um, Paul was um, dealing with in Romans 7. Um, Hebrews 8, 12. For I will be merciful to the unrighteous and their sins and their lawless deeds... I will remember no more. That is such a good scripture. Because the Old Testament was, you know, if, you, if you, you're good, you get good. If you're bad, you get beat. And so, you know, it, it, but when Jesus died on the cross, he took the curse, okay? So if the law is all about cursing and blessing, and the curse has been taken, what's left? Blessing. Jesus Christ has taken the curse. He's taken the curse of sin. And so all that's left is actually blessing. And so, so in Hebrews, it, it, it was a change because before, if you sinned, you were, you were accounted to that. If you, you know, were good and it was like, that's where they get karma from. But here's the thing. He's, in, in the New Testament, it says, and quoting from the Old Testament, I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their lawless deeds. I will remember no more. So when, you're, when somebody's remembering your sin, it's not Jesus. Because he doesn't remember it. And, or it could be you. You go, oh, Lord, I've done this, I've done that. He goes, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> All right. Um, I might leave the, the rest of next time, so because uh, we're going to get right into Abraham. But we're actually going to look at how Abraham did the wrong thing and still got blessed. <laughs> And you know that that was the case. And that's, that's not saying, you know, we'll just go out and sin and um, you'll be okay because there are consequences for sin. I mean, David had consequences for sin because it went right through his family and those families. So, you know, there are consequences for sin. But the fact is, is that Abraham, I'll, I'll tell you this much in, in, um, for next week. I'll, get, I'll give you this question. Um, so when, when, uh, when Abraham went to, um, down to Egypt, um, oh, look, I'll, I'll do it. Shall I keep going? Because yeah. it's really good stuff. All right, because it'll finish off what we're talking about. Okay. So let, let me read this. Genesis 12, um, 10 to 20, and then Genesis 13, 1 to 2. Now there was in the land, and Abram went down to Egypt to dwell there, for the famine was severe in the land. So first of all, 
God says, um, you know, go and I'll, I'll take you to a place and you'll know it when you get there, right? So he gets there and there's a famine. So what does he do? In the flesh, he goes, oh, I'll go down to Egypt because I know I'll get fed and I'll get looked after. However, um, I might have a problem being protected, so I better lie about my wife, right? So, so what he does, it, it, it was sort of a lie because he, he was a sister you know, in a way, but not really. So, so first of all, what he did, he, he stepped out by faith. Now, who knows that if God sent you somewhere, he'll provide for you, amen, and he'll protect you, he'll do it all, even if it looks like a barren place. So he gets to Hebron and then he goes, oh, no, I better go down to Egypt. So did he do the wrong thing? Yeah, he did the wrong thing. So, and then, and then he thought, oh, I'm worried for my life, I better, I better lie. So, so it came to pass when he was close to entering Egypt, he said to his wife, indeed, I know that you're a woman of beautiful countenance. Therefore, it will happen when the Egyptians see you that they'll say, this is his wife and they'll kill me, but they will let you live. Please say you're my sister, that it may be, um, be well with me for your sake and that I may, I may um, live because of you. You know, I, I say to my boys, I say, don't, don't get involved in the world where they go, oh, look, just do that and do this, and, you know, like, um, just, you know, just burn a CD or just, just do it this way and don't, don't pay for it, you know. I, I had somebody the other day, I bought a car and they said, um, just, just change, change how much you paid for it. You don't want to give that money to the, the government. I'm like, no, I, you know, yeah, I don't want to give that money to the government, but I'm going to do the right thing because God blesses me. I don't need to get my blessing by doing things dishonest, right? And so he's like being dishonest, but he's going, oh, that's how I'll live. It's like, no, how you live is God will protect you, you know? So anyway, so, so it was when, and, and this is why Paul just thought it was funny when the Pharisees would go, oh, look at Abraham. Look at what a righteous person he was. No, he wasn't. <laughs> it was just like you and I. So it was when Abram came into Egypt that the Egyptians saw the woman that she was beautiful and the princes of Pharaoh also saw her, commended her to Pharaoh. And the woman was taken to Pharaoh's house. He treated Abraham well for her sake. He had sheep, oxen, male donkeys, male and female servants, female donkeys and camels. But the Lord plagued Pharaoh in his house and great plagues because of Sarai, Abram's wife. And Pharaoh called Abram and said, What is this that you've done to me? Why, do you, why did you not tell me? that she was your wife. Why did you say she's, she, she's my sister? I might have taken her as a wife. Yeah, that could have happened. He might have gone, oh, well, he's a sister. I'll, I'll take her as a wife. Like, how is he going to handle that? But now, therefore, here is your wife. Take her and go your way. So, uh, so Pharaoh commanded his men concerning him. They sent him away with his wife and all he had. And Abram uh, went up from Egypt with his wife and all he had with Lot to the south. Abram was rich in livestock, silver and gold. Where did he get that from? He did the wrong thing. He actually lied. He actually tried to protect himself. And, uh, and, and then he came out of that place blessed. <laughs> so, who sinned? Abraham or Pharaoh? Abram. <laughs> Pharaoh nearly sinned if he hadn't figured it out. Who did God plague? Pharaoh. Who did he bless? Abraham. <laughs> Why? Because God does not impute sin to the righteous. Now, if you heard me say it's okay to sin, you have been listening wrong. I never said that. If you sin, you play with fire and you'll get burnt. But God does not impute your sin to you. If you slow, if the Bible says, if you sow in the flesh, you'll reap from the flesh. So this is not, this is not Pastor Rob saying, go, go and sin, you're right. I'm not saying that at all. But what I am saying is that even when we do, and we know at times we will, God is still going to bless you. Because it's actually out of his blessing. See, do you, know, do you know what turns me to God more? Is when I'm blessed when I don't deserve it. That's really what gets my attention. You know, If we go, oh look I'm doing okay, I'm in the blessing of God. And then I, I think, God you're blessing me, I don't deserve this. I haven't been acting in a way that even deserves this. And God just does it because I'm his child. You know, we do that with our kids. Mm. You know, if, if um, when my kids are at our place, if they're, if they're next door at the pub and they're, and they're swearing and caring, not saying they would, but let's say they are, right? I'm not going to go over there and go, don't bother coming back here for dinner tonight. <laughs> I'm disowning you. No way. What am I going to do? I'm going to bring them home. I'm going to give them a feed. And I'm going to sit down with them and say... Do you really think that behaviour is who you guys are? You can do better than that. 
Yeah, Dad, you're right. <laughs> it's not going to withhold my blessing, is it? Because it's actually, because it's, it's out of blessing and out of love that I have the relationship that I can actually talk to them on that level. Amen? That doesn't make them go, oh, great, Dad, Dad loves us anyway, let's just go and do more. It makes them go, yeah, you know, you're right, Dad, I shouldn't be carrying on like that, you know. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. So, um, guess what? He did it again. <laughs> so in Genesis 20, verse 2 to 7, it says, Now Abraham said to Sarah, his wife, she's my sister, to King Abimelech, right? And God came to King Abimelech in a dream at night and said to him, Indeed, you're a dead man. <laughs> again, who did the wrong thing? Abraham. What was Abimelech doing? Nothing. He was just like, and God says, you're a dead man. It's like, what? <laughs> so, he uh, came to him and he said, you're a dead man because of the woman whom you've taken, for she is a man's wife. But Abimelech had not come near her and said, Lord, will you slay a righteous nation also? Did he not say to me, she's my sister? And she, you know, this is after he'd done it before. He hadn't learned the lesson. So, um, so she even said to herself, He's my brother, and in the integrity of my heart and the innocence of my hands, I've done this. And God said to him in a dream, Yes, I know that you did this in the integrity of your heart, for I also withheld you from sinning against me. Therefore, I did not let you touch her. Now, therefore, restore the man's wife, for he's a prophet. And get this, and he'll pray for you, and you shall live. <laughs> the guy who did the wrong thing, he nearly put this guy in a wrong position, and God goes, You're a dead man if you touch her. He goes, give, it, give him back his wife. He's going to pray for you. <laughs> Isn't that incredible? That's incredible. But, you will, but if you do not restore her, know that you surely shall die and all um, who are yours. So King Abimelech, look at this, took sheep, oxen, male and female servants and gave them to Abraham and restored Sarah, his wife, to him. And Abimelech said, See, my land is before you. Dwell here if it pleases you. Then to Sarah said, Behold, I've given your brother a thousand pieces of silver. Indeed, this vindicates you before all who are with you and before everybody. Thus she was rebuked. So who sinned, Abraham or Abimelech? Who was it? Abraham. Who did God say you're a dead man? <laughs> Abimelech. Who did God bless? Abraham. This is Old Testament. This is not even New Testament. This is Old Testament. But Abraham believed on God. It was accounted to him as righteousness. He was in right standing with God. And even when he did the wrong thing, God still blessed him. But guess what? We know that Abraham became one of, one of the greatest men. And it wasn't because he was a good guy, as the Pharisees tried to say. It was because he understood the righteousness of Christ. And he understood the relationship that he had with God. And it changed his life. We look further when he went to uh, you know, sacrifice his son and all the things about Abraham. And he was a friend of God. This guy who was you know, saying the wrong thing about his wife nearly gave him up to other guys. And, you know... God continued blessed him, but you know it was the, you know here's the thing: it's the blessing of God, it's the goodness of God that leads us to salvation, leads us to right standing with God, leads us to repentance. It's not the other way. People think, well, if they, you know, if they understand the judgment of God, you know, like they'll, you know, out of fear and trembling, oh, you know, it's just like, no, 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 because that doesn't change your heart. The law does not change your heart. It's, it's the relationship with God and the fact that, you know, here's another, here's another example. Say a young boy comes to his dad and asks if he can borrow the keys to his car. He goes, yeah, just look after it. It's a nice guy. Yeah. And so he takes it down the road and he speeds and he crashes it, right? And it gets, um, you know, trouble with the police and he has to go to court. Who will he find harder to um, explain it to, the judge or the father? The, he's not in relationship with the judge. He just take the fine and go on his way. But to the father, he actually sinned against love. The father gave him the keys, let him use his car, and he abused it. So, so then he has to go back to a father who actually did it in love. What do you think is going to happen there? He's more likely to actually change his ways because of the love of the father than change his ways because of what the judge actually said that he has to do. That probably, does that help? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, 
God has put us in right standing with himself. We've been justified freely by his grace. We have imputed righteousness. Jesus took the judgment for our sin and we get undeserved favour and blessing. Lord, we just thank you for your word today. Lord, just as our eyes are closed and our heads are bowed, Lord, if, um, just, I just want to give this um, out there. If anyone has not accepted Jesus Christ, he loves you. He did everything he could for you. He's actually given you the gift of salvation and the gift of righteousness. All you have to do is receive it and say, yes, Lord, I accept that into my life. I'm thankful for what you've done for me. I want a new history. I want my old history um, wiped away. And I want to love you and serve you in response for what you've done for me. If that's you, you know, pray that prayer. And the Bible says is that if we call upon the name of the Lord, we will be saved. So, Lord, we just thank you for your word. We thank you for your encouragement. Lord, we thank you just to get those foundations again in our life. We thank you for everything that you've done. We thank you for putting us in right standing with you. And, Lord, may I live our lives that are worthy of everything that you've done for us. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. And God bless you.